Good evening. You are watching the live arc. This is a virtual space which connects past and present, indigenous and cosmopolitan, rural and urban, national and transnational, folk art and high art. Under this big umbrella, we are currently engaged in a forum called Being Artsy with Dr. Puna Marora. What is being artsy? Here is where practitioners and theorists alike chisel and sculpt not only concepts that they are struggling with, but techniques that they have mastered. We are going to talk about the doubts and convictions and arrive at a big consensus over a period of time. My guest today is Dr. Sharda Natarajan. She's by training an art historian with a PhD from the MS University in Baroda, where she specialized in medieval South Asian art and sculpture and architecture. Dr. Natarajan did her postdoc at Humboldt University in Berlin, Germany. She has taught at a number of institutions, most notably the University of Hyderabad, Ashoka University, Shivnadar University, etc. She's currently working on Hoysala sites, and we will be talking about a range of subjects, most notably artistic agency and heritage. Dr. Natarajan has really been a very enthusiastic art historian committed to working with art students, young kids, and basically the public in trying to understand what do we mean by art? in the contemporary context. Let me begin with a very simple question. Sharda, if, I, if you don't mind, that's what I'll call you. Yes. Mm -hmm. what, do, what do we really mean by heritage today in the context of art, art history, art conservation? What is this concept? Why is this so important? So, um, so uh... Let me start with the notion of um, heritage as it is defined by the uh, UNESCO and you know, work down to my own conception of what heritage could be, because I think there's a huge range that is not entirely covered by the UNESCO dis description of heritage. But we've Great. all heard of world heritage sites. And so I think the UNESCO has a very interesting notion of, sorry. Uh, has a very in interesting description of what heritage is, which is basically something that is, the word heritage itself comes from the notion of inheriting something, you know, the word in heritage and inheritance are related to each other. And the fact is something that comes down to us from the past. So past is definitely part of the definition of heritage, something that uh, we have inherited in the present, which kind of uh, is, very much part of our present, which is, uh, uh, which is present in our present, which uh, in some sense enriches our lives and which has uh, important consequences for the way we see ourselves, for our identity, for our notions of uh, culture, of stability, and something that we want to pass on in the future to our, the next generation, to our children and uh, from then on, to future generations. So heritage is really um, quite um, a magnificent area that heritage covers. One of the things that we uh, notice among um, people's understanding of heritage is they think that it's only man-made monuments, you know? And when we think of heritage, we think of temples, we think of uh, um, uh, mosques, we think of gorgeous cathedrals, we think of uh, forts, we think of palaces. But actually heritage uh, as it is defined today also includes natural heritage because there's so much of, um, there are so many uh, wonderful uh, biosphere reserves and um, extremely uh, specialized areas which, are, uh, which have like endemic species, which are magnificent to look at, which have incredibly aesthetic value, which are special, uh, because uh, they have this amazing biodiversity or some special natural features. So geological wonders, um, national parks, 
um, rainforests, all these are also included in the UNESCO definition of heritage. And in, over and above that, we also have a notion of intangible heritages, which are usually community heritages. They could be anything from uh, ritual practices to cuisine, to uh, some performance tradition, to something like uh, herbal medicine, uh, even falconry is, is actually seen as an, in, the practice of falconry is seen as sport, is seen as an intangible heritage. And then there is another level of heritage, which is personal heritage, right? Uh, objects uh, that belong to us, which could be uh, heritage to me, it's part of my heritage. Yeah, so it could be something like my grandmother's puja bell, which she used. And I mean, I, I, I'm not, I don't use it as a puja bell, but it's a beautiful object to me and it's part of my heritage. And it has more, it has aesthetic value. It has historical value. Yeah, but it also has a personal connection to me. Family. It's very much Family. part of, yes, of my identity. So I think heritage can be defined in so many different ways. Yeah. And is it, so, is this, yes? Yeah, so, Sorry. you know, in a way you're saying it's very broad. Mm -hmm. It's very inclusive. But um, that leads me to ask, isn't it a bit problematic that we say some things are heritage, but what would you say is not heritage? Uh, well, something that, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting exclusion, you know, uh, what would not be heritage? Maybe something that doesn't have, uh, in some sense, historical value. Yeah, something that doesn't come down to us from, from the past because the very word heritage, uh, the notion of inheriting something is, uh, is associated with the past, something that uh, doesn't in some sense come down to, from the past to us and something we don't particularly care about passing on to the future. And maybe okay. it could en enrich our lives today. Uh, you yeah. know, uh, like, like uh, you know, the gizmos that I have around me and stuff like that, but that's not really heritage. Yeah unless it becomes vintage and I can pass it on to my son, yeah? It's things so, I use. Uh, so there may be some things that are not heritage today, mm -hmm. but a few decades from now, we may look back and say, wow, you know that um, uh, cassette player that is lying in my closet or you know, something that has uh, outlived its utility, something that m my mother wore mm -hmm. or my grandmother passed on, but I didn't value, I'm not valuing it today, but it may gain value for some specific reasons that we can't anticipate today. So uh, I'm trying to ask, isn't this a uh, process of selection or inclusion or exclusion um, kind of unpredictable and uh, almost capricious. Yes, but th there's also the incredible danger of hoarding a whole lot of junk, which may yes. or may not rank as yes. heritage for the next generation, right? Yes. Uh, so I, I'm not sure where one draws the line. I suppose yeah. one of the lines that could be drawn is how mobile you are, how you move from city to city and how much storage space you have in your in your okay. home. So that could perhaps be a very yeah. unusual way of limiting what you yeah. have on as heritage. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, we we'll leave it at that. But yeah. uh, it's very important to, you know, problematize it, you know, that it's not a, a, a controversy or a, something that we've arrived at and we'll stick with it. it we may revise it as we go along because we don't know uh, what will become heritage in the context of something that we're experiencing right now that we hadn't thought of passing on to the next generation. I'll leave it at that. Absolutely. But um, uh, tell me, what's your experience of uh, talking about heritage to students of art history and artists themselves? Because uh, whenever art historians or curators in particular are talking about, okay, we'll conserve this. This is worth preserving. Um, how do you communicate this? What are the uh, misgivings that 
uh, students or curators face? Um, when it comes to artists, like when, when working with artists, they were willing to, I've actually found that their a notion of what could be conserved or what could be saved to you know, maybe include in an artwork or something of that sort is way wider than what I would consider heritage as an art historian. Okay, the stuff that I would consider junk would be oh valuable property for them and something that that has aesthetic value. So uh, uh, so I don't usually have a clash with um, art students and very often what I try to um, encourage them to see is uh, not heritage as uh, as is I try to you know transmute heritage which is uh, comes with a label right in a, a heritage object in a museum or something that we are supposed to venerate as heritage so I try to transmute that into something that's more alive that's not pickle bottle heritage yeah so I want them to understand that heritage is uh, something that they can have a dialogue with oh. and, and so. Uh, and and in some sense, it does, even if it's a mute object, if, if it's, a, it's a, a broken stone sculpture, the whole notion of actually spending time with it and trying to understand the context from which it came, the materials with which it's made, the, uh, the artistry that went into making it or the lack thereof, and so on, and the kind of post histories that that object went through, whether through vandalism, through natural breakage or whatever, tells a bunch of stories that are absolutely fascinating. And if that is not heritage, a huge narrative, which actually is embedded in your past, I don't know what, what kind of thing to call heritage actually, because there are, heritage is something with stories associated with it, amazing stories. Yes. So uh, I want to hang on to mm -hmm. this concept of you know, having a dialogue with something, which is from the past and which will engage us in, in potential dialogues in the future, the nature of which we can't anticipate right now. That's absolutely fascinating. And I hadn't thought about that. But I also want to direct your attention to how this is this process of having a dialogue with something or with some stories, but not with others, uh, has become so politicized. You know, the concept of forming a nation, for instance, which is a very young concept, um, is drawing on some stories, but not on others. Some monuments, but not on others. Some rituals, but not others. And so uh, how do you alert your students and how do we as educators alert people that uh, there is a very uh, insidious um, process also going on, which uh, limits and of course, politicizes and uh, forecloses the notion that, uh, let's say, you and I might want to create a pluralistic society, but others might want to create a less pluralistic or a unidimensional or a uni ethnic uh, identity. Do your students see this as happening and do you alert them to it? Mm, there were a couple of, let me start with this understanding of, uh, I mean, I'm just trying to rephrase what you're saying. The whole notion of culture can, uh, ought to be inclusive and yeah. uh, heritage ought to be inclusive. It ought to allow participation. It ought to uh, allow for wonder and speculation from all constituencies. But what heritage does is kind of, it tends to exclude people. Yeah, yeah. It, there are and increasingly so in the recent past, because these have been, uh, you know, hot houses of debate and um, uh, hate politics. It, it, it does actually happen. And in the past, this is not a new phenomenon. You know, when I was studying, uh, when I was uh, studying uh, discourses about uh, Indian uh, sculpture and architecture from the 19th century and even earlier than that, I, I was I was quite quite perplexed by why the colonial regime almost immediately after what they call the mutiny, we, what we call the Great War of Independence or the revolution or the revolt, why was it immediately after that, that they kind of invested a whole uh, bunch of money, resources, institutionalization 
on preserving um, heritage objects. You would think that they would be uh, they would be you know affected negatively by the uh, by the what they call the mutiny, and they would uh, you know reject uh, the whole notion of conservation. But you realize that. Um, at the level of a nation state, at the level of a colonial empire, and then eventually at the level of a nation state, uh, these heritage objects, especially monumental heritage, is a, precisely the location where a whole bunch of politics, a politics of sovereignty, the politics of independence, of democracy, or of uh, colonial control is actually played out. So that is actually the arena in which a huge amount of politics has always been played out. And it's yeah. going to remain so. And today, as a sovereign nation in, in India, we kind of redefine us. Uh, a lot of our heritage is defined in terms of um, a national identity. Okay, yes. there are community identities, but largely, for example, the legal status of a, of a heritage object is at the national level, sometimes at the state level, but it's also, it also reflects back. It, it could be under Archaeological Society of India in the state, for example. But at the same time, the whole notion is that this is a national treasure. Mm. And the UNESCO, even the UNESCO recognizes it as national monuments, despite the World Heritage uh, uh, you know, label that it gets. They still okay. belong to nations. So the identity is defined at the national level. OK, good. So let's uh, switch gears a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't announce this, but uh, we decided that we would call our conversation today. Mm -hmm. uh, heritage in our backyard. That's right. Um, could you elaborate on that, please? Obviously, not everybody has a historical site or a monument in our respective backyard. So I'm absolutely certain that that is not true. I think we do. Okay. 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 So you want to complete your question? I'm sorry, I interrupted. Yeah. So what what do you mean by heritage in our backyard? So. Uh, I mean, just look at the situation in India today. We are literally, the pen, subcontinent is a very ancient civilization. And most of our cities and towns today are, uh, are palimpsests. They're actually layered, layer upon layer on, uh, on settlements that already existed, perhaps from the prehistoric period, right? And uh, definitely from the medieval period onwards, you can see that most cities, city aggregations or towns actually are layered on uh, prior settlements, which could be rural, which could be urban, which can be trading centers, or which could be along trade routes. So I'm almost certain that wherever you live on the subcontinent, with the exception of perhaps the deserts or uh, the mountains or impenetrable forests, uh, I think if you just look in your backyard, you will find medieval remains, if not all the way back to prehistoric remains, and at least uh, 18th, 19th century remains. And this, I, I'm willing to guarantee, if you look hard enough, you'll find it. And there's still traces of it, despite urbanization and modernization. This is what I mean by heritage in your backyard. If you can actually uh, poke around and find these objects, which are uh, literally in your backyard, and you kind of start tracing uh, their history, their ancestry, their, um, you know, their involvement in your local uh, culture and your local politics, then I think uh, that would animate an understanding of history way more than what we learn from our history textbooks. And so uh, what's been the fallout of your uh, spotlighting this notion that almost all of us have heritage in our backyards? Has there been some pushback? Has there been some wonder? Has there been some um, activism? What, what's happened? So I have not been very effective as of now uh, in the sense of promoting this particular idea because it's it's still in its, uh, in its infancy as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so uh, what I would like to share with you is uh, you know, what I did in during the lockdown and uh, in, the, in the subsequent phases when we were somewhat, uh, we had time on our hands and we could actually explore the neighborhood. So what I, I live in Bangalore, in the north of Bangalore, slightly on the, on the outskirts. And uh, apart from my regular work, I decided to pick up Epigraphia Karnataka, 
which has documented um, you know a lot of inscriptions in uh, across Karnataka. It's an amazing uh, work, which is the turn of the 19th to 20th century, um, uh, and it has inscriptions, it has transliteration, and it has translation. So I worked with these, and I uh, decided to use Google Maps and Epigraphia Karnataka to guide me to monuments in my neighborhood. And sure enough, I found um, more than 50% of them are actually there and in situ, as mentioned by uh, Epigraphia Karnataka. I'd like to share a few slides of stuff that Please. I found. Can I do that? Absolutely. So let me, let me just, um, are you able to see my screen? Uh, yes, with lots of small pictures. Is it a PowerPoint? Are you able to see uh, the PowerPoint? No. no? Okay, sorry. Uh, I'll have to stop and start again. Is yes. that a PowerPoint? Yes, okay. Yes. Yeah. So, um, you go to full screen. Are you able to see that? Yes. Yes. So this this was just oh. about three kilometers from my house. I have a little scooter, so that's ideal because you can you can go through the back lanes and the side roads and stuff like that, and into villages. So you don't have a problem of parking. You can park wherever you want, and you can actually do a lot of uh, bumping along uh, village roads. So this is actually about six five to six kilometers from my uh, house. I just kind of this was not recorded and it might not be very ancient, but uh, Karnataka is full of these wonderful snake stones that you find usually under a large ficus tree. Okay, so usually a peepal tree. And uh, these are venerated everywhere. Uh, every village will have three or four of these. And usually you can find them by looking for a large ficus tree. So the ficus tree leads oh. to the snake stone. Okay. Okay, and I've also been toying with the possibility of dating because the sculpture is quite, uh, um, there are like, I've made three or four typographies of sculpture, but they seem to be quite, uh, you know, uh, I can't find a date for them because they're not inscribed. And I was wondering if I could use the girth of the people tree. I've been asking some people who work with from biologists, uh, whether we can actually use the girth and in some non-invasive way to find out the, the girth of the tree and find out its age and see whether this stone relates to the age of the ficus itself, whether there's some correlation possible, you know? It would not be straightforward, but it's a fascinating idea. Yeah. And here's another one, again, uh, discovered uh, from near my house. Uh, I just went past in a scooter and you can see a lot of very recent, um, They've laid claim on it. It's it's a temple in worship, and the snake stone is next to it. It's a tiny little temple, and you can see somebody's artwork, recent artwork on it. Yeah. So here are this was another scooter trip that I did to a more magnificent location near Belo. It's Angadi, and these are hero stones. Again, South South India is full of them. I'm sure they have versions of it in North India, but. Uh, so many of these uh, villages and um, fields in South India will either have hero stones of heroes who have, um, you know, uh, been slain, usually defending cattle or defending a king. And you will find sati stones as well for women who kind of uh, gave, gave up their lives on a funeral pyre. So this could be a combination of the two. Here is a little, uh, a beautiful little uh, house that I found near pretty close to my place. And uh, I thought, oh, the tiles are so magnificent. And let me just take a photograph of it. And just across the road, I realized that I had stumbled on this particular monument, literally across the road. It was, there's a shasana from the Vijayanagara period. And it's, it talks about a temple which was, uh, uh, which existed there. And there was a kind of feeding program that was going on. It's a Vaishnava temple. And Achutaraya had donated money for Ramanujakuta. And here is the temple. So this is like uh, about two kilometers 
by scooter from my house and i live in the city you know i really live in the city yeah and like this is and this is a vijayanagara period temple just there and it's still wow. in worship so this is the most amazing part about uh, living in india because you actually living on layers of heritage if you just take the trouble to find it and this too is pretty close to my house it's a chora temple oh, in the field amazing. this is a little more yeah. glamorous yeah so uh, but but again it's like 10 kilometers away from my place by scooter through a village wow so, yeah are you showing more slides i have a question yes yes so no. uh, there are you know similar uh, sites in and around delhi as well mm -hmm. and i uh, i want to I, i mean you're talking about dating you know so when you date something you actually locate it in a history that's right but um, i have found that Uh, despite the effort of dating it and despite the 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 reliability of dating it there are all kinds of st stories circulating around these sites that uh, also mythologize these uh, findings these excavations remnants her heritage pieces and all of a sudden you go from you know this happened during 1857 to uh, actually this is where lord ram put his foot or you know sita dropped an earring or yes. uh, whatever you know so uh, uh, what fascinates me and actually gets me quite annoyed as well i'm not sure which of the two competing emotions i get swayed by uh, is that history kind of bleeds into mythology and mythology bleeds into history is that something that happens in south india as well or is this a peculiarly north indian uh, proclivity not at all i think it it it's, it's it's pretty old as a tradition yeah so sometimes you have to uh, account for natural features by something that relates to mythology uh, but i also do think that it's 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 a nice part of uh, the human imagination if you can act activate it with some kind of myth a narrative a story uh, it it might even help in its conservation right uh, okay. but on the other hand i really do feel that we are mature enough as as a nation as a, a bunch of educated people at least uh, with access to primary and secondary education i mean it's not universal but i think we are pushing towards uh an educated populace that uh we do make a distinction between these really pretty stories these really magnificent stories uh and what is evidence based history hmm. and uh simply because history is not exactly done like science like hmm. um, very often the reason is in inductive and we do we do not have a perfect conclusion and very often you uh, many findings historical findings are challenged by new findings yeah so we don't have this this perfect solution to every date question we ask of an object or 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 a um, patronage question but at the same time there are specific historical procedures and it is as specific as say science or technology or medicine for that matter we do need to we need evidence based medicine and at the same time we do, we do need evidence based history also so i call this a historical temple which is which has which interweaves with scientific temple and i really wish we would teach this to our children because this is something that will keep you fascinated for life if you Absolutely. ask them, yeah why and how and from where if you are able to ask those questions and look for evidence rather than uh then simply use mythology straightforwardly mythology can be used but there's a process through which you can process mythology to in some sense take out historical insights but i don't think the two should be conflated i love mythology but it is not the same as history and evidence based history is what i do professionally do you think that uh people add the mythological layer to it to give it some kind of sanctity as a means of 
wanting to venerate it or or what i mean why is it that more the, than other historical civilization you know ancient civilizations we as a people are somewhat more inclined to conflating the historical and the mythological do you have a, a, a conjecture about that why are we doing this um i do believe that it's also because uh schools don't teach critical thinking they don't teach um you know a questioning of an object and we we are more into veneration than questioning and most mm -hmm. biographies uh that we like of big people are hagiographies hey, no they we don't we don't we are not in the biographical mode where where you have a kind of uh, a candid kind of understanding of a person so in some sense we we have a deep need to venerate rather than understand i i don't know if this is a this is a national trait but i i i wonder if there is a problem the the question is as long as we understand that mythology and history are separate categories and this is something that should be taught to school children yeah and they are they are wonderful in their own ways who doesn't like mythology i mean for me it's it it occupies a very big space in my world mm. but i mm. do not uh, you know i don't make a category error of conflating mythology with history and i do wish people wouldn't because uh, history itself is magnificent in its own way and if we keep mm -hmm. these separate we can actually look at the way they do interact at multiple nodes even within a single site how the mythology interacts with the history and history interacts with the mythology and it's deeply grounded in a time and space and a certain cultural ethos so we can actually see these interactions happening in locations but keeping in mind that they're separate categories and you cannot collapse one into the other and the problem is when there is a contest when you talk of historical evidence and people start pulling mythology out of the hat and tell you you have to you have to uh, you have to listen to me why because because i say this is mythology and this holds this came from our ancients and this holds over and above history and i right. don't think that that is acceptable to me right i have a, a, another conjecture just a conjecture that uh we don't uh engage with the mythic uh at the level of the unconscious we take the mythic also very literally mm -hmm. you know I, i mean i look at the greek myths and i think about you know so much of western psychoanalysis is rooted in the myths of greece right and that has become a way of understanding contemporary reality you know what is the oedipus complex why does why did oedipus kill his father why does every son wanna kill his father you know we've made a science out they have, the west has made a science out of it but we have not taken our mythology to the level of the psychoanalytic or any other way of explaining it our devotion is rooted in its literalness Do you think that makes sense? I I I'm not sure if this was universal across communities and across time. I do feel that it's kind of hardening now, to a certain mm -hmm. extent, and I do believe that there were communities all along who valued mythology as as a you know a, the the collective consciousness of Mm. a people or a tribe as archetypes mm. as mm. Uh, as analogies for what happens in real life you know mm -hmm. so the, it's remarkably productive it's remarkably fertile uh, mythology mm. is extremely fertile and that's the reason why uh, i i don't want to dismiss it in fact it's more fertile than history history is yeah. it's deeply embedded in our collective consciousness but that doesn't make it uh, it doesn't make it evidence based it doesn't make it something that no. that should be taken literally it's way yeah. too important to be taken literally because by taking it literally you're actually diminishing its power exactly. and its charge yeah exactly so and because our forum uh, you know being artsy is about uh, 
enabling aspiring artists to find inspiration and layers of meaning in their manifestation, um, I want to suggest that mythology uh, fuel art in multiple layers rather than just the surface layer. You know, so for instance, I was. Uh, talking to a student of mine and saying mm -hmm. um, just recently uh, when we were talking about Saraswati Puja and I said um, I'm a devotee of Saraswati but my Saraswati holds a, a, a video camera a, a, a mobile phone a cell to take a selfie um, you know th these are her modern day instruments she's not holding the veena or the writing tablet or whatever um, but I did manage to scandalize people by saying this as though, uh, you know, I, I'm professing to be a devotee of Saraswati, but I'm al almost caricaturing her. And I said, yes, at one level, it is a caricature, but it's also uh, a way of um, updating uh, the, the role of Saraswati in the digital age, let's say. Um, but that also uh, goes back to our education that you know, the iconography of our gods and goddesses is very static. We don't uh, let it, we, we haven't let it evolve or our, our artists haven't delved into evolving it. I mean, Raja Ravi Varma um, did bring it to the level of, you know, real life models dressing up as Lakshmi or whatever, or, or you know, film actresses posing as, as um, gods and goddesses. But it hasn't made much. Uh, 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 it hasn't gained much ground after that. You know, Raja Ravi Varma is sort of still pretty much the the the, the pulse of the, of the people. I think uh, I think we need to look at it at two levels. You know, one is the the somewhat um, stricter, more orthodox uh, level of classical traditions and usually kind of uh, kept afloat by uh, religious orthodoxy or the upper castes for it, uh, in, in the Indian context. Whereas if you do, if you go to the, uh, uh, if you go and view a folk performance in a village or you look at folk um, visual arts, you will find that this transition, this uh, hybridity, this contemporizing of uh, your gods and goddesses relating to them to local politics, to local situations, to local uh, aporias, to local dilemmas that 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 are part of everybody's life is very much part of folk practice. And I have not seen a single Terukuta performance which doesn't bring in local love affairs, local politicians, local, uh, you know, uh, all the shenanigans that go on between one community and another. It's entirely contemporary. And it's only within this so-called pickle jar tradition mode, heritage mode, that we need to be, we need to be so sacrosanct. This play always happened within the folk traditions. And I, I, I don't think that we should ignore that. We ignore it at our peril the fact that it does happen within folk tradition. So you're saying that uh, in a way, the folk traditions uh, take these stories, the mythologies, and they, they almost make them subversive. Yes, they can use it to subvert hugely. Yeah, yeah. But uh, would you say that uh, the, the kind of subversion that happens in a local Ram Leela or whatever, uh, manages to uh, rise to the surface of uh, what we're calling high art? I don't make a distinction between high art and, uh, because I think I'm those not... differences are institutional. I don't think they, yeah. they uh, exist at the level of the actual artistic process or the production or, uh, or even the conception, right? I, I do believe that those are at different levels, institutionalized categories. And they're also fairly modern categories. But I, um, but you know, I, I've also looked at attempts by what we call traditional, or I mean, by classical arts, things that have got a classical stamp right now. For example, 
uh, dance form like Bharatanatyam or uh, Carnatic music, both of which I'm reasonably familiar with, to contemporize and the efforts are usually timid and they are uh, uh, they're awkward and it just, it, it doesn't flow as easily as, and very often there are so many turf warriors who are always defending the turf and saying, oh, you are doing sacrilege, you are kind of uh, destroying uh, the art form by introducing these impure elements into it. So there's whole, this whole num number about purity, which seems to render these classical forms, these, uh, you know, these high art forms, high art within, uh, in very, very big scare quotes, um, kind of impervious to contemporizing, to uh, speaking to our, uh, to our realities today. And um, Whereas at, at other levels, at the level of popular culture or folk cultures, things are way more fluid. The boundaries are not so, um, wow. you know, they're, they're not so uh, firm and policed all the time. Okay. Um, I didn't say too much in your introduction, but uh, what I found fascinating about your career is the range of things that you've done, the range of institutions, the range of curating, the range of, uh, you know, uh, uh, playing with different uh, methods of pedagogy, for instance. And I was really fascinated to know uh, what's the most exciting thing that's happened uh, that's been empowering to the students or where you, you know, the kind of stories you would tell at a cocktail party that would make people just sit up. I think, um, let me start with the cause of why I do believe it's necessary to change pedagogy. One is because I have an extremely low boredom threshold. And if I were to teach uh, in a regular fashion, uh, a survey course or something that is absolutely by the book, I would probably be bored by the end. I wouldn't be able to sustain a semester doing that kind of course. So one, a very primary and selfish reason for, um, you know, uh, for adding some spice and variety into it was because I have a low board. And I really feel that we should play with the stuff that we teach. I feel that uh, it is it is important mm -hmm. and not in the way of, uh, you know, uh, messing, messing with the facts or something of that sort, but really introduce an element of play and, um, and entertainment and fun and, mm. uh, d uh, and deep thought and detective work and critical thinking into your writing. If you inject that into your, into your teaching, very often mm. it, it benefits students much more than what the curriculum dictates. They, they, these mm -hmm. are lessons they take and apply onto other, transpose onto other aspects of their life. So especially mm -hmm. when working with artists, this element of play is really important. And the okay. second, second thing is that uh, uh, I've taught, uh, most of my teaching career has been at the University of Hyderabad. The students come from very, um, uh, sometimes educationally, very, very often, educationally disadvantaged backgrounds in the sense that they don't have a lot of exposure to a bunch of things. So mm. how, uh, and they also come, um, with the understanding that you have to be very reverential, both to the teacher as well as to the objects that you are being taught in, in class. Mm. So, uh, mm. how do you break uh, uh, this kind of um, this artificial? What I think is an artificial reverence. And how mm. how do artists? Why are artists studying uh, art history? Why are they studying, you know, uh, Renaissance works or um, you know? Uh, medieval works from India or what, why are they studying this? Why are they studying Santi Stupa? In order to be able to enter into a dialogue with it. And so that is what I emphasize. And you don't have to speak a sacred language to enter into a dialogue with an artwork, right? If you're doing, say, studying inscriptions, you probably have to learn a language to study the inscriptions or an old version of a current language, a classical version of a language. But when it comes to visual arts and perhaps music, you, you can actually enter into, the, uh, into, the di into dialogue with the works on the basis of what you already have, your competencies. Of course, you have to learn, there is a learning curve, but it doesn't require uh, 15 years of tra tra training in some classical art form, you know, to learn to dialogue with this. And I do believe that I like injecting some irreverence into our transaction with 
our top. I love that. I try to do the same, but you know, I have a reputation, you know, for being just too irreverent. Sometimes it doesn't stick because it's so outlandishly irreverent that they they probably think I'm mad. I'm a madcap. <laughs> but yeah, I understand your impulse behind it. Um, my audience for this show is, uh, you know, young aspiring artists. So, um, you as a theorist and a practitioner, uh, what what would you like to say to young aspiring artists? Where should they find the throbbing pulse of culture that they can transform into something that might one day become heritage? Irreverent though that may be. Um, I'm not much of a practicing artist, though I started, I did my bachelor's in, in the fine arts and we learned drawing and painting and some techniques. So the only way I keep in touch with art is basically in touch with actually uh, practical uh, painting is by doing some children's illustrations, okay? So I don't have the time to, uh, to spend actually creating an art language for myself or- But what would you say to your future art historians, your future curators? Uh, wh what's your nugget? What's your takeaway for them? I, I don't have anything to say to art historians. And because I, I, I just consider myself one of the uh, many people in the field and my approaches uh, are largely, uh, uh, you know, s some of the approaches I get are actually from my personal experience and also my experience as a teacher, which has actually been for so many years, a teacher of uh, in a fine arts department as a kind of art history support to a fine arts department. So making, um, you know, understanding symbolism, these things are very primary to look, looking at artistic agency. These are primary to my way of thinking, but I don't have a prescription. Various art historians do various kinds of things with their artwork. But if I were to talk to students, uh, many of whom come into the department uh, with a tremendous resistance to art history because it has always oppressed them. Uh, they come from non-English speaking backgrounds very often and understanding art history is like, oh, it's just something to be, you know, to be done with. You just do the exam, you pass it and that's enough. So mm. my whole, I, my whole mission in life is to get them to have a flavor for the art of the past and of alien cultures, things that they don't relate to in the normal, to get a flavor for it and uh, to understand the fun of actually uh, grappling with, uh, with the content of the past, with the symbolism of the past, with the aesthetics, with the visuals, with the techniques and so on, and see how it can engage them in a way that uh, it, it kind of leaves them with, you know, it's like tasting blood. Yeah, so you cannot, for the rest of your life, separate yourself from your historical heritage. And when I say historical heritage, as art historians or as people working in art, art departments, it doesn't mean only ancient medieval Indian art. It also means Picasso. It also means a huge bunch of Western art. It means manga. It means, you know, uh, comic books. It means a whole bunch of other stuff that is very much part of our visual culture. We are hybrid creatures today. And it's very much part of our visual culture. So how do you... Uh, you, co you reckon with these works and make them part of your life, make them part of your visual culture and your psyche. You know, it has to, um, it has to sink in there and not in, in a, with an attitude of reverence, but with an attitude of equality and actually interrogating what is part, uh, what, what, what is part of your visual culture, what is part of your cultural surroundings. Yeah, so. And, and take, take away the dryness out of the academics of it, which is so. Exactly boring and intimidating and tedious you know the, um, I find that uh, even in subjects like cinema which is my field that uh, even cinema in in academic terms they find to be so dry and so um, um, austere you know mm -hmm. they want to play with their own concepts without understanding the the background to it and so in that i'm uh, in agreement with you even though we come from very different 
mediums. This has been such an enriching and enjoyable conversation. I'm sure our audiences will appreciate it as well. I want to thank you for bringing the very, very rich range of experiences that you've had and experimentation that you've done. Um, hopefully that uh, we will be able to continue this conversation, both with you and with other speakers as well. So thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank yeah. you very much, Poonam. And this has been a, a wonderful exchange of and a place where I, I took it as an opportunity to uh, talk about things that I usually don't express in public. So this, thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. I'm delighted to be able to share this forum with you. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye.